This morning we have a special treat. As I stated in the announcements earlier, we begin our conference, the Chafer Seminary uh, Pastors Conference, tomorrow, and the theme is on the role of the Christian in the nation. And uh, today we have a special speaker. I believe that God in his uh, sovereignty, his providence, provided this opportunity. Um, I was, at, as I stated earlier, I was at the APAC uh, National Policy Conference this last week in Washington, D.C., and on Monday night they had a uh, kind of a dinner. It wasn't the normal d- a banquet, and uh, they changed things up a little bit, and so it was a great opportunity to uh, schmooze and get to know a number of different people. And uh, one of uh, my friends in APAC, a lawyer here in town named Larry Finder, said, you have got to meet Congressman Louis Gohmert. He's here. He he said he almost knows as much scripture as you do. <laughs> so, see, when you don't know much, you're really impressed with anybody who knows just a little bit more. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, I got to meet Congressman Gomert, and there were, of course, dozens of people standing around wanting to uh, talk to him. And uh, he took the time, and when I, he, I was introduced to him, he immediately stuck out his hand and said, just call me Louie. And he is uh, just a great guy. We talked for a little over five minutes and just really, really connected. And then he said, you know, I'm going to be in Houston this weekend. And he was speaking at, this, uh, at a Faith and Values conference uh, that was held uh, last night. And there were two or three people in the congregation who attended that. And I said, well, that's really interesting. And I told him about our conference. And I said, if you can stay over through Sunday morning, uh, I'd love for you to come and speak to the congregation. He said, I'd love that. And in fact, one of his staff people said he loves nothing more than to come and speak to a congregation in Texas. He's the first Republican to be elected to uh, his seat in the first congressional district of Texas since Reconstruction. And he is a strong, strong advocate for Israel. He is a very strong uh, conservative He attended uh, Texas A&M, and uh, Dan Benson, back in the corner, surprised me this morning by going up to him, and they threw their arms around each other, and they were old buddies from back in uh, uh, Aggie days. And then uh, uh, the congressman also went to law school at Baylor, and from there served in the Judge Advocate General's uh, Corps in the United States Army. So we are pleased to have him come. He is a Southern Baptist, so if he says amen a few times, which he already has, we understand why. Uh, we don't quite do that as much around here, but that doesn't mean it's not in our heart. There's a few people out here who want to do that uh, every now and then. So, uh, uh, Louis, why don't you come up? Here's a mic for you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's taking a real chance, uh, you know, inviting somebody like me to come up here to the... Uh, pulpit and and to share this with him but it's great to be here and yes i I grew up in the first baptist church of mount pleasant texas um i I, uh, accepted christ when i was six some worried that was too young Uh, i remember what i was thinking at the time my parents thought well he's six let's take him to the preacher and and uh anyway um they took me to the pastor and to his home, and we sat in his study. And uh, anyway, there just suffice to say, there are so many times in my life I've prayed for the faith I had that night and for the clarity, you know, because the older you get, the more cobwebs, the less you know. You you know, we, we just encumber our faith with all kinds of strings, and, and it was so clear, and it has been. My mother, uh, my late mother, used to, I mean, the earliest stories were from the Bible. I have uh, prayed for wisdom most days uh, since I was six. I was so impressed with, you know, the story of Solomon requesting that when he had his choice. But I do think God has a way of preparing us for for what lies ahead. Um, And actually, the First Baptist Church of Mount Pleasant, there weren't a lot of amens. Uh, you know, you'd get looks, uh, you know, if you did that kind of things. So I've loosened up over the years. But, in fact, the story was told about my church that um, a fella came in and a uh, visitor just came right up the front row. And the preacher got to preaching, and he'd jump up say, hey, man, praise the Lord. And he kept doing that. Finally, the head deacon came down and said, sir, you're going to have to 
keep your seat and remain quiet. He said, I can't help it. I got the spirit in me. He said, I don't care what you got. You didn't get it here. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> so anyway, um, I, uh, I, I planned on going into the army. Uh, Dan and I were classmates through A&M. I had an army scholarship. I was the army four years. Uh, and just so you know where I'm going, uh, um, Robert asked me to uh, give a testimony briefly about where I'm from and then tie into our obligations in uh, to our government. And he, he started with a great, great scripture. Um, but I had an obligation for Army four years. I, I run into people my age that say, man, we all remember our draft number. I don't. I couldn't tell you what it was. It, it seemed like it may have been in the mid I, I'm, I'm just not sure, because I planned to go to Vietnam. I mean, my country was sending people, and if my country was going to send people, I was going to go. And, uh, um, that seems strange to a lot of people uh, that I meet from my age now. But, you know, we were patriots. And anyway, in 74, we pulled everybody out of Vietnam, and I was told, um, well, the Air Force scholarship guys were told, we need you guys to convert to 90 days. Most of you need to do that. I asked the colonel when the Army Air Scholarship guys were called in, you going to make the same deal the Air Force got and convert in the four years to 90 days? He said, not hardly. Uh, but we are trying to encourage everybody to wait, do more schooling. And I thought about if we weren't at war when my four years were up, I might go to law school. Maybe that was where I was supposed to go. And so anyway, it just he was pushing uh, those of us that had scholarships to take a delay. I had always thought about going to law school where my mother went to college. She put herself through, had an um, alcoholic dad and a mom that didn't work, but they lived a block from Baylor. So she worked full-time, put herself through in two and a half years. And I, and my sister, older sister went there, and I just thought, you know, that anyway, it all fell together. And so I did that before I went to the Army. I didn't know until I got my orders whether I was coming in infantry, which was my original request, or JAG, and, and got the orders, and turned out it was JAG. Uh, you fill out a dream sheet, as uh, Captain knows, and um, um, put all three choices. Since we're brand new married, no kids, no war going on, let's go to Europe. So I was told I'd be going to Germany, and I got my orders to uh, Georgia, Fort Benning. That's good for the Army because the first two letters, G-E, were my request, you know, Germany. But anyway, it's close. See, those of you that have ever been in the Army, you understand that's not bad for the Army. But uh, anyway, uh, Kathy had done most of her growing up in Dallas, and I done my growing up in Mount Pleasant. And she didn't want to go to Mount Pleasant. I, I, we had a month before we started the Army, and I came home one day, and she said, we can't live here when you're done with the army. And I said, "What happened? What did somebody do?" She said, "You know the dress star, store down by the square." I said, "Collegiate shop, yeah. It's the only one in that square." And she said, "I was down there doing what I've done all my life in Dallas, just looking at dresses in the store." And this lady came up and said, "Can I help you, Kathy?" She said, "I didn't recognize her." I said, "Do I know you?" And she said. Well, you're Louie's wife, aren't you? He said, I can't live like that. I can't live like that. <laughs> so anyway, I said, well, I just have this feeling Tyler is calling. And so anyway, we both went and interviewed. Both had uh, offers from the two places we interviewed and um, practiced law. Well, my mother had been found to have a tumor back in the 70s. And when they removed what they could, they said, it may be back in a year or 20 years. We've done all we can. It took 15 before it took her life. All through the 80s, um, mother would say, you know, God meant for you to be a public servant and you'd be a good judge. I don't want to be a judge, mother. I'm, I, I'm in litigation with these lawyers. I don't want to listen to them all day like a judge has to. I make a lot more money than a than a judge makes. There's just no way. And anyway, she died in January of 91, and I start thinking, because she was a brilliant woman, thinking about things my smart mama used to say, and um, 
three or four months later, I had a hearing, a preliminary hearing on a breach of contract case. I was representing a woman, I guess probably early 40s. Judge was in the 68, 69, been the first Republican ever elected in Smith County. Uh, had been challenged many times, but over 32 years, nobody had ever been able to beat him, not even come close. He calls up, which some of y'all know, uh, you're supposed to have the other lawyer on the phone. It can't be one-sided. And the first thing he said was, uh, that's a mighty fine-looking woman you had in my court. You think she'd go out with me? <laughs> well, thank you. You realize that's not really appropriate, is it? And I realized that. I told him I couldn't help him. And he thought, well, I just didn't know if you might could help me with this deal. Well, I couldn't. But I knew we needed a new judge. So for six months, I, I was going, Lord, please let somebody step up to run. It will be good. And then I'll know this is not my thing. I don't like to test God. But I, that nobody stepped up before Thanksgiving. Kathy and I wrestled with it, prayed with, over it. And by Thanksgiving, we just had a peace about it. This is what we're supposed to do, just a peace. Um, I've said before, both running for judge and running for uh, Congress was a calling because it was toward the end of my time as a judge. I felt like we needed to change some legislation. Constitution says you don't do it from the bench if you're a judge. And I was having more and more single moms come before me for felony welfare fraud. Same situation. Um, basically, you know, almost identical every time. Got bored with high school. Somebody would say, well, just drop out and have a baby. One case, it was her own mother. You know, the government will send you a check. They drop out and they find out you really can't live on that money very well. So they'd have another and get another check, but they get further and further behind the ones that ended up before me. So every now and then somebody would break the chain. But it made them dependent. It lured them into a rut they couldn't get out of. And how they ended up before me is they'd finally realize one lady had 15 kids. She didn't even know where they all were. But they would realize, well, maybe if I get a job and I don't report that, maybe with the, the federal welfare and the job money, I can finally get ahead. Well, that's welfare fraud. So they'd come before me. And it just bothered me. The role of government, as you, as you read and you read in Romans 13, and I, I won't go ahead read the whole thing, you know, Romans 13, 1 through 7, if you do good, you're supposed to be encouraged. If you do evil, be afraid, because God doesn't give the government the sword in vain. It's God's avenger of evil. And here we had a government that was luring people into ruts from which they couldn't get out. That's not the role of government, and I just felt like I needed to do something about it. I've been asked by reporters over the years, you said you had a calling. Do you hear voices? <laughs> and I would explain, I wish I heard voices. It would be so much easier, wouldn't it? I mean, or, or if a hand came out and wrote on the wall what I was supposed to do, wouldn't that be great? And you wouldn't miss the point. But I've never heard voices, so I have to pray and be in Scripture, seek wise counsel, and it's all a pain sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes it's, fine, it's hard finding wise counsel, especially in Washington. But anyway, that's why I come home on the weekends. But uh, anyway, you have those feelings, and that's, that's all that you need to do something. Well, um, it also irritated me as a judge uh, people would come up because I'd have to qualify these big jury panels first thing. And um, we have like 300 come in and we pick different panels from those and go through the qualifications. And invariably, I'd say, if you think you have um, a disqualification, then come forward. I'm sorry. It ticked me off when Christians came forward and said, I can't serve as a juror. I'm a Christian. Uh, and uh, sometimes I'd say, well, I always question not to challenge their religion, that's not my role, but to make sure that they're truly disqualified. And every now and then it'd be a pastor that would come forward and say, well, I, I, I'm a Christian pastor, I just can't be on a jury. Well, of course, some of y'all know our history, and it was the church that was strongest behind the revolution. It was the church that was strongest behind abolition. It was 
an ordained Christian minister named Martin Luther King Jr. who would tell people the way, the truth, and the life that did not only a good thing in trying to help people be judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. He helped white kids like me because as a Christian, I got to grow up treating brothers and sisters of different color skin like brothers and sisters. So it was a good thing across the board. That was the church behind all the good things that have happened in America. And so anyway, I, I would uh, usually say, if they were really offensive in the way they said it, I'd say, oh my goodness, I'm a Christian judge. I, I better resign. I didn't know Christians couldn't serve in government. Well, no, no, I think it's okay for you. I'm going, but I'm a Christian too. And I, well, I'm not trying to challenge your re religion, but let me ask you, um, do you believe what's in the Bible? Are you kind of Christian? That, well, yes, of course I do. Well, you know, in Matthew 5, um, he talks about the Beatitudes, but at one point he says, if you say rock unto your brother, you'll answer to the courts. You know, Jesus anticipated there would be a need in an orderly society for a court system, for a government. Romans 13 talks about the, the government and the sword. And, and we're in a country where the founders... And and you can find in the writings they 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 were so excited, and you can feel the excitement like in some of John Adams' letters to Abigail, you know, basically that we have within our grasp what people have only dreamed of. Philosophers have talked about, but nobody's really been able to do it before. We have the chance to truly govern ourselves, to set up a government that's the people. And ever so often, we'll have an, a hiring day. We'll analyze the uh, the resumes, do job interviews, and then we'll have a day we call election day where we'll come forward and we'll decide who we want to hire to be our servant. That's what the jobs were supposed to be. And I would explain to people that, look, um, the people are the government. So when you got that notice, you are the government. You are going to sit in judgment. You're the court. You're the jury. You're the final arbiter of what the facts were in a case. You're the government. So I just want to be sure your Christian beliefs lead you to, to think that it's okay for you to say, I refuse to serve as and, and use the sword that God has given me. I shun what God has put in, my, in front of me. I am not going to participate in the government, even though Scripture says I, I'm, God's given me the sword. Is, is that your belief? Well, well, no, not exactly. You know, And then when we talk a little further, ultimately they would usually say, you know, Judge, I guess it's just that I really don't want to. I'd be uncomfortable. So, well, that's under the law, not a disqualification. Sit down. You're know, going to be on the panel. Um, but it bothers me when people would do that because it's a gift to get to govern ourselves. Not like the original parliament in England where the king could throw them out or Caesar could throw out the Senate or the Greeks. You know, they, this is a government until, it, until we don't take care of it where we get to govern, and people ought to participate in that. Um, last, I guess a few weeks ago, I was asked to, three weeks ago, asked to do the prayer for the Republican conference, a, a weekly meeting of all the Republicans. And, um, you know, I just, you know the way when you're reading Scripture, you can read the same one over and over and sometimes something different. Well, I've been trying to go through more Old Testament and uh, I noticed a scripture in Hosea, uh, and in fact, it's um, Hosea 8, 4. And I, it struck me, and I, I went and looked at a number of different translations, and I'll give you the Texas translation. And it is, and this is God telling Hosea his indictments against Israel. He said, they have chosen leaders who are not my choice. Now, we know from uh, 1 Peter and from Romans 13, you know, God, nobody's in authority without God's okay. But that doesn't mean that that's God's first choice. Look at Israel. They didn't need a king. God knew they didn't need a king, but they wanted one. 
So what does he send word? Look, you don't really understand what you're asking for. This is not going to be as good as you think. But the people demanded a king, so he gave them one. And they were never the same. And that led to problems, just as God knew. But if a country's determined to go away from what God's will is for them, eventually you'll let them. He's done it over and over. There are members of Congress say, Louis, the good thing is we don't have to worry God's in control. Said, God's been in control when every great nation has fallen. He was in control when Israel divided into two countries. He was in control when Israel fell and Judah fell. Because if you're determined to go away from him long enough, he'll let you. Um, it was an honor. It's been an honor to meet and get to know uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Um, back in, in 2009, I'd met him before. I'd been on an APAC trip to Israel before. But I just had this strong feeling with the, the snubbing that was going on of the White House toward Prime Minister Netanyahu that I just had a couple of things on my heart I needed to convey. And so I talked to Eric Cantor, uh, who usually leads the Republicans on the APAC trip, and I said, Eric, I feel like I need to go back to Israel. He said, well, that APAC trip is normally just a one-time deal, and under our ethics rules, you can't ask them, I can't ask them for you. Um, they, it has to be their idea. And I said, well, I just had this feeling. That was in June. The trip goes the first week of August. Well, seven days before the trip left, uh, my chief of staff buzzes me and said, uh, we just got a call from APAC. They've had an opening uh, for the trip leaving next week. But the trouble is, you know, in less than three hours, you've got to have everything in, your passport, the application for visa, all that stuff. And I said, well, Mike, if you'll look in my upper left-hand drawer, you'll find everything there ready to go. And so my wife and I went on the trip, and when we met with Netanyahu, um, I pointed, I said, uh, just a couple of things, Prime Minister. First of all, it's great to call you Prime Minister. First time we met, I could only call you Minister. But I'm delighted you're back in this situation. And I said, but second, I wanted to make sure you knew and that you knew many of us know. There's never been a time in Israel's history when Israel gave away land trying to buy peace, that that land was not ultimately used as a staging area from which to attack it. Well, everything got real quiet around the table, the conference table. Netanyahu is directly across from me, and he's got a good cold stare, and he just stares at me. And then he says, that's a problem, isn't it? And he just said, yes, that's a real problem. And, uh, and I said, and, and one last thing. I said, I just feel, I said, I'm not a prophet, but I know Israel's history, and I know the Bible, and I really believe you have a chance to be one of Israel's great leaders, but there's one thing that every one of Israel's great leaders had in common, only one, really, that runs through all of the greatest leaders, whether it was David or Solomon or Hezekiah or come on up through, you know, they had some that were good for a while and then they fell off. But And, and I walked up, even through Ben-Gurion, one thing, they all called upon the nation of Israel to honor the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that hasn't happened by natural national leader in a very long time. And he said, I, I appreciate that. And he said it brings to mind, in fact, what Ben-Gurion said when he he was challenged. You know, initially, after 48, uh, Israel, the Jews were driven out of their little part of Jerusalem. And they had to fight uphill with a ragtag group and retook. And he said he was challenged. What is your voucher for claiming this land? And he used the word Bible. He said he held up a Bible and yelled this is my voucher. Folks, that's our voucher. That is our security for the future. And the further we walk away from it, the more difficult we will have in keeping this nation. We won't keep it. Um, I know there are some who say, well, you know, we live by faith. And uh, as, as Romans 1.17 supports, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is, the just shall live by faith. It's by faith. It's not of works. 
Nobody can boast. But I've never met uh, Tommy Nelson, pastor in Denton, but I I listened to one of his uh, Bible studies one time, and I loved his line. Just because God is sovereign does not mean we're supposed to lean on our shovel and pray for a hole. (laughs) Yeah. There's work to be done, and there's work to be done here. And um, one quick historical story of John Quincy Adams. Some, you know, sometimes you get those feelings you ought to do something, whether it's in a local government, a school, or in your community. You just are for somebody. You have those feelings. And, and what I do is test, you know, is this somehow self-serving for me? And if it's really not then it's probably the Holy Spirit, something I should do. John Quincy Adams was elected president in 1824, the first son of a president, a former president, to ever be elected. Somebody said it's happened since then, but that was the first one. Y'all know it's happened since then, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, 1828, he gets defeated by Andrew Jackson. Um. He had corresponded to England with a guy named William Wilberforce. And if you hadn't seen Amazing Grace, the William Wilberforce story, you ought to. Right, read the book. See the movie. It's a great movie. I've seen it probably 15, 20 times. Sometimes I need to see it. Wilberforce, 1785, felt God was calling as a young man in his 20s to end slavery in the British Isles. So he runs for Parliament. He gets elected to Parliament 20 years 1785 to 1805, every year he's fighting to end slavery. 18, uh, 1805, he doesn't end slavery, but he gets a, a law passed that ends the slave trade in all of the British Isles. 28 more years, year after year after year, fighting to end slavery. A few days before he died, 1833, slavery was outlawed altogether. England beat us to doing the right thing on that. This was hard to believe. Well, 1830, John Quincy Adams does the unthinkable. He's been president, and he runs to be a member of the House of Representatives because he believed God was calling him to end slavery. Sworn in 1831, year after year, he filed bills to free specific slaves, to end slavery altogether. Every time he was called upon on one of his bills, he would stand up at his desk there in what we now call Statuary Hall, and he would preach a hellfire brimstone sermon about the evils of slavery. You know, and how can you expect God to keep blessing us when we're putting brothers and sisters in chains and bondage? And at one point, he had filed bills like that so many times. The Rules Committee passed a rule he couldn't do that anymore. So then he had to fight the rule so he could go back to filing those bills. Nearly 17 years he served there. One day he had a massive stroke sitting there at his desk on the House floor, carried him back to a room off the House floor, and he died two days later, and reportedly said he was at peace, which didn't make sense because everybody knew he thought he was supposed to end slavery, that that was his calling. What people didn't realize, back at the back of the room, elected in 1846, was a homely-looking, tall, skinny guy, no beard, uh, people that heard his voice in speaking uh, sometimes said he didn't have a very pleasant speaking voice. Um, but a sharp guy, guy great wit. Um, John Quincy Adams was not warm and fuzzy, but he liked that guy Lincoln at the back of the room. Took him under his wing, mentored him. When when Adams died, his family asked Lincoln to be one of the uh, pallbearers. Lincoln's defeated in 1848. Uh, new guy sworn in 1849. Thinks he's done with politics. He goes back home, makes a little money, representing the railroad, doing some legal work. But then the Compromise 1850 happens. He just feels the need. I, we we got more states coming in with slavery. Gets back involved, loses, loses, and then he gets elected president in 1860. He was asked after he was president, Was there anything memorable that ever happened in your two brief years in the House of Representatives? He said, not really other than those powerful sermons John Quincy Adams used to preach on the evils of slavery. I knew it was wrong, but it basically etched it on his soul that it had to be stopped. John Quincy Adams didn't do it. 
but he was faithful. He was used to help the guy that did. You never know. Let me just end with this personal story. Um, you know, as as a judge, I had a murder case, and everybody in town knew all about it, and everybody had chosen size. We tried to pick a jury a couple of times, weren't able to, so ended up changing venue to Dallas. During the trial, I found out that a couple who were friends and uh, in our church and been in my Sunday school class, sweet couple, but their uh, 10-year-old son, um, turning 11, but Michael had been found to have some kind of tumorous tissue in his nasal cavity, so they took him to Children's in Dallas, and it didn't look good. Well, after court one day, I went up to Children's and saw them, and and it didn't look good. And I just had this feeling when I left. He had a little sister, I thought. And this was in the days of cassettes. Um, I need to get them a, him a cassette player. And he can listen to stuff and get some blank cassettes. And he and his sister can record. And it will be good for their family. And he'll enjoy playing with it. And I need to get him a cassette on heaven for kids. I called around Dallas the next day during a recess and uh, finally found one um, a tape on heaven out in uh, Mesquite. You know, it was like 30, 45 minutes to get out there and get back, and we took an hour and a half break for lunch. And uh, I just, the next day, I wasn't sure I was going to have time. I thought about blowing it off. And I thought, no, you just, you felt like you need to do it. It's not selfish. Do it. So I got him the cassette recorder. I got him the tape on heaven. And uh, that evening I took it by, and he and his sister loved it, and they played with it. And uh, anyway, then he was found, it, just to have a complete remission, it went away mir- miraculously. I was so excited. Everybody that had been praying for him, it was exciting. But within a matter of months, it came back with a vengeance. And it eventually took Michael at the cemetery when I embraced his father, Dennis, and we both wept. Dennis said, Louis, and they were trying everything, experimental stuff, and they were staying at a hotel in the city where the, they were trying some things. And he said, that night at the hotel, at 2 o'clock, Michael said, Daddy, can I listen to the tape on heaven? He said, sure. He said, while he was listening to the tape on heaven, he went there. And it chilled me to the bone. I came so close to not giving that child comfort in his last minutes on earth. Let me just tell you, folks, if you feel the spirit moving and it's not something selfish, get up and do it. God bless you. You, Louis, you're not our congressman, but you have our support. And the next time you see uh, Culberson, you say, you know, he ought to come by one day because we're in, we're in his district as well. But we appreciate you. We know the pressures that are on you as a congressman. You're in the heat of the battle. We understand that this is uh, we live in a in a world where our war is not against the seen but against the unseen. And the pressures on you are, are, are incredible, and you have our prayers and our support, and we appreciate your stands, and we appreciate what you do. We appreciate your stand for freedom in this country, your stand for the economic policies that are healthy, and above all, we do appreciate your stand for and support for Israel. And uh, we have our prayers. Everybody kind of take a deep breath and kind of move around just a little bit. And uh, we're going to get into part two here. (laughs) Scripture says, uh, I usually start with a few scripture. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son of God does not have the life. 
He who believes on him is not condemned, but he who believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Before we begin, uh, just to look at the word for a little bit this morning, let's bow our heads together in prayer. Father, we're thankful that we have the guidance of your word, that it informs us not just about you and about us, but it gives us the principles, the guidance, the direction on how to order society and our responsibility to one another. And Father, we thank you for the wisdom that we are beneficiaries of that has been handed down through the generations of those who have dug deeply into your word to discover the principles of, of law and government and politics. And for those like Louis who serve and serve faithfully. Father, we pray that you would guide and direct us now as we look at your word in terms of our responsibilities towards you and towards our government, and that you might challenge us with the responsibilities that we have from your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. One of the episodes that occurred during the, uh, uh, at the beginning of the American War for Independence is uh, one that speaks to a core issue that provided the motivation, the instruction, and the, um, and the thinking that lay behind everything that happened in 1776. And it had to do with the pastor. His name was uh, John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg. His father actually founded the Lutheran Church in America. He and his brother were both, uh, were both Lutheran, Lutheran pastors. And Muhlenberg pastored two churches in Woodstock, Virginia. One was Episcopal, one was Lutheran. And he also served in the House of Burgesses because there was this tradition that was understood that, that pastors weren't just relegated to the pulpit, but that they were involved in the community and they were involved in politics. Today we have gotten this idea in a lot of Christian denominational traditions that somehow the only role that pastors have is to, uh, to teach your congregations and to pray, and the only role Christians really have is to pray. Otherwise, it's activism rather than just being involved. Our responsibility is, as citizens in the nation, is like everything else the Scripture says, according to 1 Corinthians 10.31, we are to do everything to the glory of God. And that means that you as a citizen under the Constitution in which we uh, exist are to be as involved as possible. We are the government. And that applies to those in the pew as well as those, uh, those in, the, in, the, in the pulpit. And that is our tradition, and uh, that's our heritage. We're not just to do, I love that uh, line from... Uh, uh, that, that you gave uh, from Tommy. Uh, actually, Tommy and I both worked together at Denton Bible Church when it was a small church just getting started, and, and uh, he was a student at Dallas Seminary, and I was a student at Dallas Seminary for, for, for a short time, that you don't pray for a, a, you don't just pray for a hole while you're leaning on the shovel and expect God to, to uh, make a hole, that there are responsibilities that we have under the, under the sovereignty of God. Well, in 1775... Uh, Muhlenberg was authorized to raise and command a regiment in the Continental Army. On that Sunday, he went to church on the 21st of January, 1776, and he began his services at the Anglican Church in, in Woodstock. And for his sermon that morning, he went to the third chapter in the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, which begins, "...to everything there is a season." When he came to the 8th verse, the verse states that there is a time for war and a time for peace. And he said, and this is the time of war. He removed his uh, clerical garments to reveal that underneath he wore a uniform as a colonel in the Continental Army. The next day he led 300 men from his congregation, and his county to form the nucleus of the 8th Virginia Regiment of the Continental Army. It was initially posted in the south to defend the coast of South Carolina and Georgia. He went on to become a, uh, a general in the Continental Army 
and he saw services in the battles of Brandywine, Germantown, and Monmouth. And his statue is in the small rotunda down in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, underneath the Capitol in, uh, in Washington, D.C. He had a brother. His brother's name was Frederick Augustus Conrad Muhlenberg, and he pastored a Lutheran church in New York City. And he told his brother Peter, he said, you're out of line by being so involved politically. He said, that's not the role of the pastor. That's not the role of the church. Our, our, our role is to simply, simply teach the Bible and teach spiritual truth. It wasn't long after that that the British invaded and captured New York, and the British understood that the most dangerous force in the colonies was the, the pastors in the pulpit. In fact, they referred to them as the Black Robe Regiment, and they, they hated them. And so the first thing that the, that the uh, British did was they began to burn churches, in, including uh, Frederick Muhlenberg's church. He repented. True repentance isn't sorrow. He may have been sorry. True repentance is a change of mind. And he changed his mind, and he bega- became involved in the uh, revolutionary effort. He was, after the war, after the signing of the Constitution, he was elected to the House of Representatives from Pennsylvania, and he was the first and third speaker of the House of Representatives, and he was also the first signer of the Bill of Rights. These men stood in a tradition that we had at the beginning of this country that it was the pastors in the pulpits who were the intellectual core of this nation. The, the pastors at, at, in the colon, colonial period were well-educated. Uh, too often people today think of pastors as simply those who are uh, uh, who get the call of Jesus and grab a Bible and go thump a pulpit somewhere. But the tradition in this nation and in, Protest- and, and in Protestant churches coming out of the Reformation was an educated and learned clergy. Ninety percent of the pastors in New England had degrees from Yale or Harvard. Uh, the universities that, were, that we think of today as, as, uh, as the Ivy League schools, uh, Dartmouth, uh, was founded as, a, as originally as a training school for missionaries. Uh, Yale, uh, Harvard, uh, Princeton, many others were founded initially to train pastors for the pulpit ministry. Ninety percent of the pastors in New England were trained, had, had uh, college degrees. They had to know Greek and Latin and Hebrew before they ever entered into uh, college. They knew more about Greek and Hebrew when they, before they went to college than most uh, Dallas Seminary graduates today know when they get out of seminary. That's how well-trained and well-educated they were. Um, and they, they were in, deeply involved in all of the affairs uh, of, of government. When the call uh, went forth after the Battle of Lexington and uh, the British were uh, coming on Boston, it was the pastors who led men from their congregations, such as uh, uh, Reverend William Payson, who led men from his congregation to Boston to fight uh, in defense of Breeds Hill and Bunker Hill. Uh, Reverend Jonathan French came with his musket and his surgical bag. Reverend David a- Avery brought 20 from Vermont. Stephen Farrar from New Hampshire led two companies from his congregation. And John Steele had a huge church, a mega church for that day of a, of a couple of thousand in Pennsylvania, and he brought 900 men from his his congregation. Of course, you know that on uh, April the 21st that the first shots heard uh, in the Revolutionary War were heard in Lexington, um, Massachusetts, that as the British uh, were, were coming out from, from Boston and they were seeking to arrest uh, uh, John Adams and uh, uh, John Hancock, and that was the reason that Paul Revere had left Boston to go on his ride was to warn them. And they were being hidden by the pastor of the church at Lexington, Jonas Clark. And as the British were coming, Jonas Clark called up the Minutemen. And the Minutemen were the men from his congregation who came out onto Lexington Green that day to stand their ground uh, against the British. And that's where the war began. It was at Bunker Hill, in this, in this famous paint, painting. There's a picture of a black man down in the lower right corner uh, behind, the, uh, behind the soldier. His name was Peter Salem. He was a hero at the Battle of Bunker Hill, later fought at Saratoga and, and Stony, uh, Stony Point. And uh, he was there because he came down from uh, New Hampshire because a black man by the name of Wentworth Cheswell, who was a black, also a preacher, had ridden north as, as Revere Road west 
uh, Cheswell had ridden north to sound the alarm, and men from the north came down, from the congregations in the north came down to, to fight in the, in, in, the, uh, in the defense of the colonies. Also, you have, have men like uh, John Witherspoon, who's indicated here in this uh, great picture that hangs in our nation's capital. That is a picture of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. I've marked out John Witherspoon there in the row standing behind Thomas Jefferson. He was a Scottish Presbyterian theologian. He was one of the men who helped draft the Declaration of Independence. Uh, He was a theologian who taught the Bible at Princeton. James Madison, who later became President of the United States, who was one of the great, also one of the great drafters of the the, uh, Constitution, one of the writers of the Federalist Papers, uh, went to what was known then as the College of New Jersey in order to study the Bible under uh, 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 John Witherspoon because of his great theological acumen. He helped write the theological creeds for the Scottish Presbyterian uh, denomination, the Presbyterian denomination uh, here in the U.S. There has been a standard of the, in this country of pastors being involved. In fact, there was a professor in the political science department at the University of Houston by the name of Donald Lutz who t- took uh, many of the major writings uh, of the, the, the period from the mid-1760s to 17, uh, to, no, after uh, 1805, I think, uh, and he analyzed them b- uh, back in the uh, early 80s to discover what was the source of the ideas of the writers uh, in America during the revolutionary period. And what he discovered uh, from an analysis of 15,000 documents uh, with an in-depth analysis of about 3,100 was that about 80% of these political pamphlets were actually sermons that were published and printed. In that day, sermons were printed. They called them election sermons. Uh, Anytime there was an election and a new uh, legislature uh, convened, a pastor was invited to preach a message based on the Bible to the legislature. So they had, uh, they had these uh, sermons that were called election uh, sermons. And so 80% of the political pamphlets that were written during the Revolutionary Era were uh, sermons preached by uh, pastors in their congregations. So the most frequently cited source in the, all of their writings uh, during this era was the Bible by 34% of their writings. That's the influence that they had. And most of those came out of the Old Testament because they were focused on trying to understand the philosophy of law that was embedded within the Mosaic law. So most of these quotes come out of uh, Exodus and and Deuteronomy and a number of other passages in the Old Testament. And when they quoted the New Testament, they went to passages uh, related, as uh, uh, Louis referred to earlier, 1 Peter chapter 2, Romans 13, focusing on the role of the Christian in, uh, in relation to uh, the government. They most, these were the most frequently quoted New Testament passages. Uh, Old Testament passages, I stated, were primarily, first of all, Deuteronomy, then Isaiah, Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus. Lutz writes that when reading comprehensively in the political literature of the war years, one cannot but be struck by the extent to which biblical sources used by ministers and the traditional Whigs undergirded the justification for the break with Britain, the rationale for continuing the war, and the basic principles of America's Americans writing their own constitutions. They got the idea of a constitution from the fact that in the, in the scriptures, God willingly limited himself and defined himself by entering into legal contracts known as covenants with his people. And so they believed that if God was willing to limit himself and to define his relationships with his creatures on the basis of a written contract or covenant, then it was incumbent upon human beings to define their relationships with one another on the basis of a sound written constitution. And so that became the basis for why the United States really spearheaded the whole concept of a written constitution. As I I stated earlier, I mentioned the election sermons. uh, Pastors also were called upon when uh, when a company of of soldiers was recruited and they would elect their officers. 
and that was a, a little different system back then. But they would be the uh, pastors were asked to come and preach a sermon at that time to the uh, military uh, organization, and these were called artillery sermons. And so there were many of these election artillery sermons that were printed and published and were read by people all the time. They didn't waste their time watching television or playing games on the Internet or just uh, uh, different things like that. So in order to be uh, entertained, they read sermons. Uh, And this established the foundation for their understanding of law. It came really from, at the time, though, they speak a lot about being a Christian nation. That's because there were only, or fewer, at the time of the Revolution, there were fewer than 2,000 Jews in America. So uh, prior to that, especially in the colonial period of the 1600s, it was almost all Christians. But what they were focusing on, when you would hear them, listen to them define what they meant by Christian, they were looking at the Old Testament. They were looking at the Mosaic Law. So in truth, what they meant was a Judeo-Christian way of thinking about God and man and government. Max Demont, in his book, Jews, God, and History, writes that the Mosaic Code was the first truly judicial written code and eclipsed previously known laws with its all-encompassing humanism, its passion for justice, and its love of democracy. And in the Puritan ascendancy in England in the 17th century, there was so much uh, investigation of the role and limitations of government and the rights under which Christians could resist government because of the uh, perceived tyranny of the divine right uh, argument from the uh, uh, James the I, uh, Charles the I, the Stuart Kings, that this caused those, those pastors and those theologians to probe prof- deeply, deeply into the scriptures to determine what God said about the limitations of, of, of government and who really has the authority in these particular issues. And so this, this permeated the culture uh, in England, and then it was brought by those Puritans when they came over to uh, colonize in Massachusetts. As the culture was, was deteriorating back in England, they, they had to leave. And so they, in, in the, for example, in the 1630s, there were over 40,000 Puritans who immigrated from England to New England in order to establish that city with a light set on a hill. They were not trying to establish the kingdom of God in America in the post-mill sense that comes, comes later, but they wanted to sh- basically come over here and show the folks back in England how it was supposed to be done. You all have done it wrong, and this is how government is supposed to be set up so that there is real freedom on the foundation of the biblical law, on the foundation of the Mosaic law. Some centuries later, at the end of the 19th century, in a Supreme Court case in 1892 called the Church of the Holy Trinity versus the United States, uh, Chief Justice uh, David Brewer uh, wrote and wrote about this later on, saying that this republic is classified among the Christian nations of the world. It was so formally declared by the Supreme Court of the United States, but in what sense can it be called a Christian nation? Not in the, he, he's not saying in the theocratic sense, but in the sense that this is our heritage, this is where we got our laws, this is where we got our understanding, and that is what made America great. If you shift, if we shift from our biblical roots, then we will lose all that we have because all that we have is because we've thought within the framework of how God created uh, everything. And he says... um, he says it's called a Christian nation, not in the sense that Christianity is the established religion or that the people are in any manner compelled to support it. Nevertheless, we constantly speak of this republic as a Christian nation, in fact, as the leading Christian nation of the world. Uh, Rabbi Daniel Lappin, in his book, America's Real War, an Orthodox rabbi insists that Judeo-Christian values are vital for our nation's survival states. As a Jew, I am filled with profound gratitude to America. Life in America has been good for American Jews. It would be churlish to deny it. I believe, believe Jews live comfortably in America only due to that Christian heritage. As an American, I am grateful for the religious outlook that guided the founders of this country. As a Jew, I tremble at the thought of what a post-Christian America might mean for my people. In the 
in the thinking, in the mental furniture of our founding fathers, they understood certain things to be true. They understood that God created things. This is embedded in the preamble to the uh, Constitution. Uh, this is recognized in the thinking of uh, a statement made by Timothy Cutler, who was in a Connecticut election sermon of 1717 wrote, God, having made man a rational creature, hath, as it were, twisted law into the very frame and constitution of his soul. They understood that as creatures created in the image of God, something was built into us that we had to function according to the absolutes of law. And even if those absolutes get twisted, there's still a sense, the Scripture says, that everybody has a sense of something is right and wrong. Talk to your most extreme relativist. You go, I, I challenge you, go find one of your extreme liberal friends and uh, tell them that, um, that everyone who commits murder should be hung uh, from the public square. And they're going to say, that's wrong. See, they understand absolutes. They just don't like our absolutes. Everybody has a sense of right and wrong. From the very beginning, in this picture that's also in the Capitol building, uh, the, of those coming, the pilgrims coming off of the deck of the Speedwell on July 22nd of 1620, reading the Bible as the foundation and praying to God, recognizing that it is only due to his providential blessings that they could have uh, success. As, as, as the clergy thought about the law, and talked about it. They used different terms. They talked about a non-written law called the law of nature. But they defined that. And it wasn't just some abstract law, even though it was unrevealed. It was the law of God. John Davenport, in his Massachusetts election sermon of 1699, this is a hundred years before the, the Constitution is written. You'll see that a hundred years before the Declaration was written, the language and verbiage of the Declaration is found in the writings and the, and the sermons of the pastors in the 1600s. He said that the law of nature is God's law. Uh, Samuel Hall, in a Connecticut election sermon of 1746, said, I think there can be no doubt about this, but that in all cases where the matter under determination appertains to natural right, the cause is God's cause. John Bernard, in his Massachusetts election sermon of 1734, said that the voice of nature, meaning natural law, is the, God, the voice of God. Thus, tis the vox populi est as vox dei, the voice of the people is the voice of God. This was the view of the founding fathers. John Jay, who was the uh, first uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court, stated that moral or natural law was given by the sovereign of the universe to all mankind, being founded by infinite wisdom and goodness on essential right, which never varies. It can require no amendment or alteration. He understood, even though the founders often spoke about God in terms of being the uh, 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 the infinite being, the supreme being, they had a clear understanding of the Christian gospel and believed in it. Uh, James Madison stated that the transcendent law of nature and of nature's God, which declares that the safety and happiness of society are the objects of which all political institutions aim and to which all such institutions must be sacrificed. In their thinking, they understood that God was the creator who defined everything and he built certain things into the very nature of mankind. And even this leaked out in the preamble to the Declaration of Independence uh, written by Thomas Jefferson. They couldn't help it. This was part of their mental baggage at the time. And in, in the preamble states, we hold these proves to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Notice that they are endowed by their creator. This doesn't come from the government. It doesn't come from the state. It doesn't come from philosophy. It didn't happen by chance through evolution. It, they are God-given rights, endowed by their uh, creator. Incidentally, uh, President Obama has conveniently dropped that phrase out of his quotation of the preamble on several occasions because in his thinking, in the thinking of many moderns, that's antiquated. We get our rights from government, but the, the, what made this country great is an understanding that our rights come, and the rights even of government uh, come from God. 
Jefferson articulated this, that when a, the liberties of a nation are, are, are lost, uh, they will not be secure if the people do not recognize that their liberties are the gift of God. I'm going to skip through a couple of these other quotes and uh, get into some scripture. The foundation of their understanding of law goes back to the Old Testament covenant that God made with Noah after Noah and his family got off of the ark. God established a covenant with Noah, which we've studied many times. The foundation for government was found in a stipulation in verse 6, where God said, whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. It is the delegation of that most extreme of all judicial decisions, the death penalty, that is the basis for law. If God gives the greatest responsibility and delegates that great responsibility to a human court, then all of the other responsibilities, lesser responsibilities that are part of government are also delegated to man in order for him to administer his own, uh, his own affairs. And so the foundation uh, is laid there in the scripture that government is not something that man came up with, but it's something that was instituted and established uh, by God through a covenant system. And that same covenant, incidentally, we might want to think about this when we hear it raining outside, the deluge today, God promised that uh, he would never again destroy the earth by water. And there would be a sign of this covenant, the whole covenant, set in heaven, which is a rainbow. And that rainbow is a reminder to us every time we see it of God's promise that he would never again destroy the earth by water. There are other elements in that, in that uh, covenant, as I've reminded you many times. There's the element of the death penalty, and there's the element there where man is uh, uh, authorized to eat meat. So I always say when you uh, go out and have a good steak for your lunch today, uh, you should be reminded of the Abrahamic covenant, I mean of the Noahic covenant. You should be reminded of God's promise uh, through the rainbow, and you should be re- reminded that God also authorized the death penalty. They all go together. God established government, and the reason that God established government is because of an understanding that men were inherently bent toward evil. Now, that doesn't mean that all men are going to do evil things. It just means that there is this tendency, there is this trend, there is this, uh, this, this bent in fallen man toward evil, and therefore there needed to be a restraint of evil. This is what is seen in Romans chapter 13 where we read that rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Then do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. That is authorization to take life. That's what it means to bear the sword. He does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. This was understood by our founding fathers. John Jay talked about the depravity of mankind inherited from their first parents. And because of that wickedness, it rendered human government necessary. James Madison also made uh, statements related to this. He said, if men were angels, and no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. And so the purpose of government is to restrain evil and not, and I thought that was a great illustration uh, you used about creating a welfare system that basically entices people uh, to evil. See, rulers are to rule to restrain evil and not to promote it. Rulers are not a terror to good works, Paul goes on to say in Romans 13.3, but to evil. Uh, Do you want to be afraid of the authority? then do what is good, you will have praise for the same. So the, the founders of our nation understood that the role of government was the good of man, and that if there was no government, as John Hancock Sr., this is the, the, the signer of the Declaration's father, who was the previous pastor of that church I mentioned earlier in Lexington. He said that without government, men are in a state of war. So what's our responsibility? Our responsibility is to do everything as Christians to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31, 
It says, therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. As Christian citizens, our responsibility is to fulfill that citizenship responsibility to the maximum, to the greatest level we can, to the glory of God. Interesting, if you look at that passage later on, it's a passage dealing with what we call doubtful things. There were those who were upset that sometimes Christians would go to the slaughterhouse, which was located in a local temple, and would eat meat that had been sacrificed uh, to idols. And so they said, you, can, you can't really eat that. And there were other Christians who said, no, idols are nothing. It doesn't matter if we eat that meat or not. So it was, there was no direct uh, instruction in Scripture about this. And so it was a matter of conscience. And Paul recognized this just two verses earlier. He said, conscience... I say not your own, but that of the other. See, the issue here is conscience. This is what undergirds the First Amendment, the freedom of, the, uh, uh, of religion, that the government will not establish religion. It doesn't mean that we're free from religion, but the freedom of religion is grounded on this, this thing called the conscience, the freedom of conscience. And this is, being un- this is under assault right now. Don't let these comedians on television or, or p- pundits on television confuse you. Those who support this administration have, are, are of one voice that the issue here is contraception, that this edict from the Health and Human Services Secretary that is going to uh, f- uh, force uh, uh, religious institutions, they're not directly uh, church institutions, but they're, they're supported by church institutions such as Catholic hospitals and others, that they are going to be forced to provide uh, insurance that, that uh, provides contraception for, um, uh, for their employees. Now, what we're hearing in, the, in, 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 in most of the media and in a lot of people on the left is that this is all about contraception. It's not. I don't agree with the Roman Catholic position on contraception at all. But that's not the issue here. The issue here is the federal government has no business uh, putting the, any church organ, or church-related organization under compulsion to obey their moral standard because any religious institution has its own moral standard and moral code, and the federal government has to stay away from it. If this, if this assault wins... We have lost the freedom of religion in this nation. This is a direct evil assault by this administration against the First Amendment. Now, some people say, well, it's so small. But that's how the camel gets its nose under the tent. And once that is allowed to happen, it sets up a legal precedent and the dominoes will fall. So we get this from the Scripture. The freedom of conscience must be recognized or there is no liberty. Paul goes on to say in that passage that in verse 33, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. See, ultimately, the reason we as Christians support the government is, is what Paul says in 1 Timothy 2. We pray for the government that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. There comes a time when the civil and political situation becomes so tenuous that pastors and churches and Christians need to stop their normal modus operandi and wake up and correct things. Because if we don't, then we won't be able to lead a quiet and peaceable life and carry on the task that God has given us because there will be too much government interference. And that is on the horizon Uh, So we have to be involved. That's part of our responsibility as a believer. Paul says, This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved. You know, this same issue related to conscience and religious freedom uh, reared its ugly head last year in San Francisco. In San Francisco, the city council voted to ban circumcision. Now, the issue wasn't circumcision. The issue, once again, is the government's intrusion into the realm of religious belief. And unfortunately, higher courts declared that to be unconstitutional. Uh, so it, it, it's, these assaults are taking place over and over again, and somebody has to stop it. The only basis for freedom, we, though, we understand, as Paul goes on to say in these verses, has to do with uh, Jesus Christ.
Men are born in a state of slavery, slavery to sin. Sin is just anything that violates the character of God. And until we are free from that, we don't have real freedom. But there are two realms of freedom. There's spiritual freedom and there's political freedom. And we have to have political freedom if we are going to have real uh, spiritual freedom to pursue the goals and objectives that God has given us. This is the example of John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg and his standing in the pulpit, being willing to step away from his duties as a pastor in order to secure these religious liberties. Thomas Buchanan Reed wrote a poem memorializing uh, Muhlenberg's actions. And this was included in the McGuffey Readers, in the fifth eclectic uh, reader of William McGuffey. And I'm just going to read the last part of it because of time. And he writes, The pastor rose, the prayer was strong. The psalm was warrior David's song. The text, a few short words of might. The Lord of hosts shall arm the right. He spoke of wrongs too long endured, of sacred rights to be secured. Then from his patriot tongue of flame, the startling words for freedom came. The stirring sentences he spake compelled the heart to glow or quake. And rising on his theme's broad wing and grasping in his nervous hand the imaginary battle brand, In face of death, he dared to fling defiance to a tyrant king. Even as he spoke, his frame renewed in eloquence of attitude, rose, as it seemed, a shoulder higher, then swept his kindling glance of fire from startled pew to breathless choir. When suddenly, his mantle wide, his hands impatient, Flung aside, and lo, he met their wondrous eyes, complete in all a warrior's guise. A moment there was awful pause, when Barclay cried, Cease, traitor, cease! God's temple is the house of peace. The other shouted, Nay, not so. When God is with our righteous cause, His holiest places then are ours. His temples are our forts and towers that frown upon the tyrant foe. In this, the dawn of freedom's day, there is a time to fight and pray. And now before the open door, the warrior priest had ordered so. The enlisting trumpet's sudden soar rang through the chapel o'er and o'er, its long reverberating blow so loud and clear. It seemed the ear of dusty death must wake and hear, and there the startling drum and fife fired the living with fiercer life, while overhead with wild increase, forgetting its ancient toll of peace, the great bell swung as ne'er before. It seemed as it would never cease, and every word its ardor flung from off its jubilant iron tongue was war, war, war. Who dares, this was the patriot's cry, as striding from the desk he came, who dares come out with me in freedom's name for her to live For her to die, a hundred hands flung up reply, a hundred voices answered, I. The challenge before us is, are we going to be passive in our involvement as citizens? Or are we going to follow this cry? We're going to follow the challenge of Mordecai to Esther that I talked about on Thursday night. Then perhaps we live for such a time as this, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this time that we have to come together to be challenged by your word, to remember that it is your word that gave us the freedom foundation of this nation, that it is your word that has reverberated down through the centuries, that has given us such a, such a love of law, a love of right, a love of wrong, a definition of right and wrong. And Father, it is, it is ultimately because you have provided real freedom for us, Real freedom that was won on that spiritual battlefield of Golgotha outside Jerusalem when Jesus Christ 
died for the sins of the human race and there purchased our freedom just as you purchased the freedom of Israel in the Old Testament, just as you have purchased our freedom through that sacrifice of Christ that we can have real freedom. Father, we pray that if there's anyone here today that has never really come to understand the uh, gospel message of Jesus Christ, that there is salvation in none other, that he died on the cross for, and paid the penalty for our sins because we cannot save ourselves, we cannot produce our own righteousness, but that is only produced and as it is given by you to us on the basis of faith and faith alone, as the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk said, that the just by faith, those who are justified by faith shall live. Now, Father, we pray that you would uh, challenge us with your word that we have learned today and that you would encourage us uh, by your word.